Warning, today's episode contains spoilers. So if you have not seen the movie or TV show that we are talking about, we highly recommend that you watch it first, then listen to this episode. Thank you. All right, today we are joined by Spency Dome Piece, and uh, today we have a third person on the show, Squishy Dome Piece. Welcome Hi. to the show, Spency and Squishy. Hello. Hello. The film we're going to discuss today is the 1980 horror flick, The Shining, written by Stephen King and directed by Stanley Kubrick. I don't suppose they uh, told you anything in Denver about the tragedy we had up here during the winter of 1970. I hired a man named Charles Grady as the winter caretaker. From what I've been told, I mean, he seemed like a completely normal individual. But at some point during the winter, he must have suffered some kind of a complete mental breakdown. He ran amok and uh, killed his family. Well, you can rest assured, Mr. Ullman, that's not going to happen with me. <laughs> that's right. Mom, are you really going to live in that hotel for the winter? Sure I do. It'll be lots of fun. The only thing that can get a bit trying up here during the winter is a uh, tremendous sense of isolation. Is there something bad here? I fear you will have to deal with this matter in the harshest possible way. What did I do? I killed you with Danny. You did this to me. Didn't you? I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Here's Johnny. <laughs> Writer Jack Torrance arrives at the remote Overlook Hotel in the Rocky Mountains to be interviewed for the position of winter caretaker. The hotel, which opened in 1909 and was built on the site of a Native American burial ground, closes during the snowed-in months. Once hired, Jack plans to use the hotel's solitude to write. Manager Stuart Ullman warns Jack about the hotel's reputation. A previous caretaker, Charles Grady, killed his family and himself. Jack is nevertheless impressed with the hotel and takes the job. In Boulder, Jack's son Danny has a premonition about the hotel, and Jack's wife Wendy tells a doctor about Danny's imaginary friend Tony. She also reveals that Jack is a recovering alcoholic who once injured Danny in a drunken rage. When the family moves into the hotel, head chef Dick Halloran surprises Danny by telepathically offering him ice cream. Halloran explains to Danny that he and his grandmother share this telepathic ability which he calls shining. Halloran tells Danny that the hotel has a shine of its own and its own memories. He also tells Danny to stay away from room 237. From there, things spiral out of control as Jack starts to descend into madness, being influenced by ghosts in the hotel, and is ultimately driven to kill his wife and son. Okay, The Shining. Um, before we go into the, the cast and the crew and all that, uh, Squishy, first thoughts? Honestly, I had really high expectations, and they were really not met. I thought it was incredibly underrated overrated yeah that's what i said um <laughs> <laughs> i really didn't like it i thought it was there was like so much build-up but really no sort of big moment what about you spencer i agree i felt like there was a lot of hype around it being super scary when while there were some really good creepy moments and i applaud jack nicholson's performance and I don't know the name of uh, the son there, but he also did a very, very excellent job. And I thought it was very, very creepy for what it was trying to do. But 
like it had a lot of problems in my opinion and i just wasn't finding it very scary or very enthralling like everyone seems to think it is so, right I and I, I find that interesting because this has shown up on pretty much every list of scariest movies of all time that i've seen and i found it scary although i saw it when it came out in 1980 as a 10 year old so that to me there's a lot that i took away from this as being you know just a terrifying movie not in the sense of a monster movie, but just in terms of atmosphere and some of the visuals that we got that I found creepy. I agree that it was creepy for sure. And, you know, there were a lot of just really, really uncomfortable moments that I thought were well executed. But I didn't find it inherently scary or, you know, I wasn't on the edge of my seat. I, you know, I just had a, no relation to the characters. I had no real interest in it. <laughs> I don't know. I want. I wanted to. Now, I do really you think did. that maybe it's a sign of the times that when it came out, it was considered scary because we hadn't seen films like this before? For me, at least, I felt like it was almost cringy because of how, like, ingrained into pop culture it's become. Like, the whole Here's Johnny, like, I'm sure it was scary at the time because people didn't expect it. But when you see it in, like, every pop culture if it's like all over the place all that stuff then it doesn't have the same meaning i mean even so i mean back then i'm sure it was scary and the moment when jack nicholson's character jack torrance starts hunting his family yeah that's definitely a scary moment because you don't want that to happen but they've been the only characters we've seen for the past 40 minutes it's not really something where I'm like, I don't feel like there's really all that many stakes in it. You know what I mean? Like, if he kills the kid, well, that's terrible. The movie's over. The, the <laughs> Shining is gone. Um, if he kills the mob, okay, that's rough, and we'll see what happens. But there wasn't, like, I don't know, I didn't feel like there was really anything crazy scary because there was no explanation for why he was really doing it. And, you know, you can make the argument of, oh, there were ghosts or, oh, there was this, but... There was no sign of isolation being the cause of it, and all that happened was a couple of hallucinations, and the ghost basically said, well, I mean, you know, the the, the kid is bringing in a black person, and uh, all of a sudden, Jack Torrance is like, you know what? I think I need to kill my family. <laughs> and I didn't quite get it. So, Squishy, walking into this film, because you guys just watched it. We all watched it last night, but this was the first time you had seen it. What was your anticipation of the film versus when, what you saw? Well, my sister read the book, and she was telling me how good it was. So I was like, okay, this is going to be good. Um, I've been into Stephen King, every other Stephen King movie that I've seen. I've enjoyed. And this is like the top tier it's supposed to be. But I really don't think it was. I thought it was going to be like this big, scary horror movie. I think it was only just mildly suspenseful. Hmm. What about you, Spencer? Yeah, I'm in the same boat as that. I thought that there was going to be a lot more of, like, actual intense moments, but I found that a lot of, like, the rules for the universe were really inconsistent. Like, what were the ghosts doing? Like, the intentions were really confusing. And then some of the things that even Jack saw were meant to just scare him and, I guess, break down his sanity more, which I feel like we got to see, but there was a massive drop-off. It wasn't the slow progression of watching a man slowly lose his mind, which I feel like they were starting to do. And then all of a sudden, like five minutes goes by and then we see tons of papers being typed out and sure he gets slowly angrier and angrier, but then there's just a massive like drop between, we get a month in into the their stay at the hotel and oh, okay, he's fine. You know, he's still trying to do his thing as a writer. And then within like four or five days, He's axe murdering his whole family. <laughs> I, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't think that was. So you all didn't that. think the progression of insanity was slow enough? No, I didn't think the. I didn't think it was consistent enough. Okay. I felt like it was a very, very interesting pace, and that I was starting to see definite personality changes. And then he has a couple of hallucinations about a ballroom in what I was guessing was the 1920s, and then right. he meets the one, the guy who killed his family beforehand. And that was, you know, 10 years ago from where this movie take pl took place. And now it's, they're like, hey, you know, your family doesn't, isn't all that nice to you. Maybe you should do something about it. And he's <laughs> like, you know what? That's a great idea. 
I mean, to piggyback on what Spence said, like, they go in, like, a month after they've been in, like, the place, and things have been pretty okay, and then literally in the span of, like, three or four days, like, they just go batshit crazy, so I definitely think that, like, it was not a proper build-up, because you wouldn't go crazy in three days. Right. Yeah, we would have seen a lot more visualizations of the isolation maybe getting to Jack and stuff like that. He wasn't bothered by that by any means for a long time. It just all of a sudden he just got angrier and angrier and then had a couple of hallucinations and then went on a killing spree. Right, right. Okay, so let's get on to the cast and crew here. Um, we've got the director is the legendary filmmaker Stanley Kubrick, whose amazing film list is short, but it does include classics like Spartacus, Dr. Strangelove, 2001 A Space Odyssey, A Clockwork Orange, Full Metal Jacket, and Eyes Wide Shut. And he's generally credited as being one of the greatest filmmakers in the history of movies. And I think you guys don't really like this movie, particular movie. <laughs> No, I can't say that I would consider Stanley Kubrick to be one of the greats. Uh, he made a lot of well-received movies for their time, but looking back, I don't, I can't put him in the Hall of Greats personally. Well, you have to see the films first before you can make. I a... mean, Full Metal Jacket was really good, but I don't think it was Stanley Kubrick that made it really good. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think that's debatable, and that's a show for another time. Okay, let's move on. Shelley Duvall plays. Wendy Torrance here. She was in Time Bandits, Frank and Weenie, Rocket Man from 1997 with Harlan Williams. Uh, she played his mother in that, as well as she produced and hosted a show called Fairy Tale Theater in the 1980s. But she's probably most famously known for her role as Olive Oil in the movie Popeye with Robin Williams, starring as Popeye. And that also came out in 1980. In fact, I remember coming out after this, so I knew who she was walking into the film as a kid. Going, oh, it's the mother from The Shining, and she was great as Olive Oil. I have a lot of opinions about Shelley Duvall. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, I love the movie Rocket Man. I didn't. It didn't dawn on me until just now that she was the mom. Right. So that character, ten out of ten. <laughs> like, it's such a superficial thing, but I feel like she just doesn't fit like the role of the like, caring mother. And, like, this is just me being rude about the way she looks, but, like, it's so dumb, but, like, that's literally what, like, kept me from watching the movie, and I'm honestly kind of okay with that, because I almost wish I didn't see it. Well, I just read online, in the book, she's portrayed, Wendy is, has movie star quality beauty, and she's blonde, which is nothing like what Shelley Duvall looks like, not to disparage her, the poor actress's looks, but... Yeah, I mean, they really didn't go out of their way to make an effort for that at any point. They didn't try and... There was no even camera work to try and showcase that. They really just showed them as kind of a average family, a little, little strange on their own part. And, I mean, personally, I think that really hurt the film's ability to scare me because I didn't have a character that I could really relate to because while Jack Nicholson's portrayal of Jack Torrance was excellent... Jack Torrance as a character I couldn't relate to. Right. And in the book, Wendy is a much stronger character than portrayed in the movie. Yeah. And, you know, Danny I couldn't relate to because I'm not, I'm not like that, personally. I'm not as disconnected from the rest of the world. Now, granted, obviously, being a month in isolation does do that. But even from the get-go, I wasn't... I didn't see myself in their shoes. I was really, really just kind of confused as to why we were having to sit here and watch these awkward characters survive social situations. They were a little broken to begin with because there was an incident in the past, what was it, like three or four years ago, where uh, Jack at, went to grab Danny and hurt, him in, hurt his arm. I don't remember if he broke he it. He dislocated his dislocated shoulder. dislocated the shoulder, right, right. Yeah, and I, I saw that tension in the family, and I actually really appreciated that, that it did matter, but... Like I said, I just their personalities are not something I, I got along with personally. Right. So I, I found it really hard for me to to sit there and be like, okay, this is absolutely you know terrifying and hitting me and you know in notes that I didn't know it could hit. It wasn't doing that for me. It also didn't really feel like they were a family. Like you couldn't feel any sort of chemistry between any of the characters. Right. Like it felt like they were just working together. Or that the mom was more of like a nanny, or if or if it was just 
um, Wendy and Danny, and then Jack on the side. He didn't, like, it didn't feel like a full family. And I don't know if that was just because of what had happened previously, or if it was an ongoing problem. And Danny seemed a little disconnected anyways. Yeah, and I don't know. I kind of have just some mixed feelings about that, because I do feel like that Danny and his mom had some sort of, you know, some real chem chemistry there, but... Jack was so estranged, and he was the main character for the most part. Right. And I just, I don't know, it didn't, it didn't strike me in ways that I really could understand and, and go with, really. I felt like it just was sort of uh, us watching a movie, and it wasn't so much trying to reel us in for a true experience, because it was just almost like it was just trying to retell the book in its own fancy way, and that was that. Right. From my perspective, I didn't really need an audience identifier character, especially when I saw it at age 10. I just wanted to be creeped out, and it, it certainly, at least on that level for me, worked. Now, Danny's played by uh, an actor named Danny Lloyd, who's only done a couple of things. He was in this. He played a young G. Gordon Liddy in the biopic about G. Gordon Liddy, and he does have a cameo in the Shining sequel, Dr. Sleep, but uh, I don't think we've seen that one yet, so we can't really talk about it. But he does a great job, I think, of switching. He's got this sort of alternate personality called Tony that speaks to him through his finger, and he claims he lives in his mouth and tells him things and tells him to do things. And the actor, he as a little kid, 10, he just switches between the two characters easily, including changing his voice when he talks like Tony. I definitely really uh, dug that. I thought the performances in this movie were excellent. I just found that a lot of the structural problems of the movie were were my real complaints with it. I, you know, I really did like that. I thought that it was really cool. And I was asked multiple times during this movie, do you get what the red rum thing is? Do you get red rum? And... <laughs> When you sit there and watch the kid say red rum, okay, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Sure, that's a fancy mystery of what the heck is he talking about. And, and it was creepy. It, eh. Red rum, red rum, red rum. I thought that was really creepy. Eh, I don't know. It was like, I just thought it was a kid being weird, personally. I was like, it's, it's awkward, for sure. It's It's something I don't necessarily want to look at, but I wasn't super creeped out by it. Um, but then when they when they spell it out for you, Anyone with a brain could figure that out. I mean, I instantly saw, wait, red rum? Oh, and then I read it backwards, and I'm like, okay, murder. That, that makes sense. And I liked that he was getting flashes of it, started saying it, and then when he spelt it out, and we the mom saw it, it in the, the mirror. And she saw the that one, I, That I did think was a really, really cool moment, because... Like, that was one of the few... That's one of the few moments in the movie where the rules made sense and everything felt like okay cool we're actually going somewhere with his whole shining thing going on because at least he was trying to warn the mom about you know murder worrying about that there's a had threat. we seen red rum spelled out before he wrote it on the wall yeah you got flashes of it oh that's right yeah okay. so i right. i figured it out relatively quickly and i feel like it was almost like a turning point or like a wake-up call to the mom that like there's some serious stuff going down that, like, there's, like, her husband is actually, like, after them, and something's going to happen. Now, I will say to the audience that both Spenty and Squishy are in their 20s, so um, do you feel like pop culture has kind of ruined the Red Rum thing for you? Because when I saw it, it was a surprise. I think if maybe they hadn't shown it to us visually, like, if, the, if for Wendy and Jack, they only ever heard it. They never saw it, so hearing it is a little different than reading it backwards. Yeah, I could totally see that if they didn't show any flashes and he just started saying it, and then, like, you know, and if they didn't spell it out for the audience, really, if, say, he, you know, drew a picture of it and they, the parents picked it up, like, oh, okay, Red Rum, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Sure, I could totally see that that being a really, really interesting mystery, and then it culminates to him spelling it out in the mirror, Absolutely, but when they show you, show you flashes of it, anyone but with eyes and a my, brain. My question could is, was it, it ruined for you guys in the pop culture? Honest, no, no, not necessarily because of like how it happened. It being shown in the mirror was still like a shock factor. Okay, so that scene worked. Oh, the scene definitely worked, and I feel like that's one of the few sequences that actually does work because you, we can accurately portray how Tony becomes 
is the, is the embodiment of The Shining for Danny. That's what I figured out. I'm like, okay, I don't think Tony's somebody else in his head. I think that's The Shining and how he's perceived. How he interprets it. what The Shine is telling him. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, okay, cool. And then when he kind of just goes full Tony and Danny is gone, quote unquote, um, and he starts, you know, going red rum, red rum, and then the murder in the mirror. I was like, okay, cool. This makes a whole lot of sense. They established this. It's a payoff of the shine. It works. And as things are going. So I was like, okay, I really, really enjoyed that. And it wasn't necessarily crazy scary to me, but it was a, a good, more thrilling shocking. moment. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. a very, very shocking, thrilling moment that I thought was very well executed. Right. We'll return to 13 Days of Hallotober after these messages. Hello, this is Rod Barnett. I'm the host of The Bloody Pit, the podcast that examines films from across the decades. On The Bloody Pit, we have several ongoing series of shows within the show focused on specific things in genre cinema that I and my co-hosts find fascinating. There's a long-running series focused on Italian maestro Antonio Margheriti's films from the 1960s all the way up through 1990. There's an on-again, off-again series focused on 1970s science fiction films. There's an in-depth look at the Western movies that William Castle made before he struck out on his own and became the horror auteur that we know and love. A look at the classic Coffin Joe films from Brazil. And our long-term project to look at every universal horror film made in the 1940s. That's a long project, people. It's going to take us a long time. Sprinkled in amongst those are various other episodes focused on other stranger areas of cinema, like uh, Lucio Fulci, Dario Argento, and even some obscure British crime films from time to time. So join me and my rotating crew of co-hosts as we examine the stranger side of cinema through an exploitation lens. Except when we don't? Yeah, you never really know exactly what to expect on The Bloody Pit. So join me for The Bloody Pit. Tingling, nerve shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Here, are your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not so classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit MonsterKidRadio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Bryce, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the Head of Rondo Hatton, only on Monster Kid Radio. Moving on to uh, Scatman Crothers, he plays the hotel's head chef Halloran here in The Shining, and he's had a long TV career in film roles as an actor. You guys probably only know him from this, but I remember him fondly as uh, for a few things. One is being the Globetrotters coach in The Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island, which was a TV movie, and he's probably most famously known as the voice of Hong Kong Fooey in the 70s cartoon of the same name, which was this dog that was a janitor by day at the police station, and then by night he would jump into a filing cabinet and jump out in his costume as like a kung fu, kung, Hong Kong fooey. He fought crime with his little cat friend. And, and Scatman's voice is just so unique and distinct. You can it, you hear it 
now that you know him as an actor, when you start to hear him again, you'll recognize him instantly. It's it's almost like Vincent Price with the voice. Who is the superhero? Sarge? No. Rosemary, the telephone operator? No. Henry, the mild-mannered janitor? Could be. Hong Kong Fooey, number one super guy. Hong Kong Fooey, quicker than the human eye. He's got style, a groovy style, and a bar that just won't stop. When the going gets rough, he's super tough with a Hong Kong Fooey chop. Hong Kong Fooey, Hong Kong Fooey, His list of credits is long, and he has a small but pivotal role here, but he also has The Shining, just like Danny. And they kind of explored that, which I thought was interesting. And I, did you expect that when you saw the movie? Did you even know what The Shining was? I knew something. But going into the movie, it all kind of slipped out of my mind. So when he kind of started to explain The Shine and The Shining, I was like, okay, cool. This this works and explains a lot of Danny's weirdness and Tony and this, that, and the other. So I was... I, I dug that personally, and I also found it a very, very good reason for him to be concerned about the family because, you know, either he was getting bad signals from the hotel or he wasn't getting anything from Danny, this, that, and the other, because right. we had seen them at least have a small bit of telepathic communication. So He did get a message from Danny when he was in Florida in his head. There was a scene where they kept juxtaposing between the two characters, and Danny was calling mentally calling for help. Yeah, so there's that, and that whole that whole thing worked, and I was like, okay, cool. That's a great reason for him to show up and you know save the family. Okay, cool. He's concerned something's gonna happen, regardless of however weird and ill-established that threat was. It was still there, so I was like, okay, that makes a whole lot of sense. It establishes the rules for this universe. I dug it. It gives meaning to the title. Right. Um. You know, it worked. It totally worked. What do you think, Squishy? I thought that, like, I really appreciated his character and the fact that, like, he was still a big part, even though he wasn't part of the family, and the fact that he was sort of the saving grace, even though he didn't get very far. But I almost feel like the whole Shining, like, the whole telepathy thing was almost a little campy. I'm sure for the time, like, it wasn't as common. So it was kind of like, oh my god, like, what the hell? Right, we really didn't have many telepaths in movies. Yeah, but like, it just felt kind of campy to me, but also it was probably one of, one if not the most important part of the movie and how it went the way it did. And the thing that kills me was Halloran busts his butt to get to the hotel when he realizes that there's probably something dangerous going on. He gets there. Walks 10 feet into the building and Jack uh, cuts him down with the axe. <laughs> and that, that killed me. I was so upset when I first saw that. Yeah, that bothered me. And to me, them doing that undervalues the entire shine thing. Because when you kill off a character who establishes the rules for the universe so fast without them really getting a word in, you know, he didn't fight off Jack for a while and Jack got the upper hand. Okay, that would have been one thing. But. He got in there, and he got killed, and Danny Shine went out the window for the rest of the movie. Right, and I think for, for our, you know, from our fan perspective, as fans of comic books and, and movies of, the, of similar type, I, I would have expected Halloran to go in and telepathically destroy Jack, or at least incapacitate him. Yeah, or, you know, you, the Shine felt like all it did was summon Halloran, and that was that. Right. It really didn't... Plot, help them stop Jack. Right. Yeah, it really didn't help them stop Jack. It had no real meaning other than establishing the title for the movie because it probably would have been better than Jack versus his whole family. And it, all it did was establish why Danny's a little weird and why why Jack doesn't get the immediate surprise on his entire family. Right. 
Like, that's really it. I didn't love that. <laughs> now, moving on, uh, for, we have a couple more actors here just to quickly touch upon. We've got Tony Burton, who had a small role as Halloran's friend, who provides him with the snow track so that he can get up to the hotel in the blizzard. Um, you may recognize him. Audiences, audience members may recognize him. He's most famously known as playing the corner man in six of the Rocky films, starting off as Apollo Creed's corner man and then helping Rocky out after Apollo was killed in the ring. Then we have uh, Philip Stone, who plays Grady. He was the care- the original caretaker who went nuts in 1970 and killed his wife and two daughters. Uh, he was most notably in the movie Flash Gordon, also from 1980, A Clockwork Orange, and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Then finally, I just wanted to mention Joe Turkle, who plays Lloyd the bartender in what he's either a ghost or in Jack's mind. He did tons of TV shows, and fans will remember him as Tyrell in Blade Runner, who created the replicants. Now, let's quickly get on to Jack Nicholson and, you know, what can we say about the three-time Academy Award winner and 12-time nominee here? It would take a whole show for us to really truly do Jack some justice in his illustrious career. But some of his movie highlights are Roger Corman's The Terror, Easy Rider, Five Easy Pieces, Chinatown and his sequel, The Two Jakes, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, The Witches of Eastwick, Wolf, in which he does a take on the Wolfman movie. Multiple roles that he had in Mars Attacks, including The President. He was in Anger Management, The Departed, and he's probably most famously known among fans as playing the Joker in the 1989 Tim Burton film Batman. What did you think of Jack's performance here, guys? Absolutely no complaints. I think he was the absolute perfect person for this role. And there's there's nothing else to say. He was the perfect Jack. You, like, his... Descent into Madness was so easily believable because he was just already, like, it felt like he was already a little loose um, when he had his interview. Right, a little unhinged to begin with. And then it was just, he was terrifying. Like, imagining him being your husband and him chasing you around a fucking hotel (laughs) i would piss myself like that's terrifying especially especially he does this you know thing where he arches his eyebrows and he has that devilish grin it's just he just puts on a great performance here i yeah in my opinion like i keep saying this movie was a little poorly written in my in how i keep saying this and the structural issues are there but Jack Nicholson did a great, great job. Jack Nicholson really kind of sealed the deal with everything he was trying to do. I totally thought that once they hit, once the movie itself hit certain notes, Jack Nicholson's character reacted so properly. I right. felt like for what they were trying to do, Jack Nicholson did a great, great job. And you know, his facial expressions, absolutely unreal. And... His switching from being kind of a psychologically confused victim to the perpetrator of horrendous crimes is very visible, right? And very very fun to watch because descent into madness. He, you know, he goes and has a crazy hallucination in room two thirty seven and comes back to the family like, "Wow, I really didn't find anything. I'm really kind of worried about my son." And then you see (laughs) his face switch back to this the madness induced crazy person right like when he's sitting next to his wife and i thought that was like really just a good moment of acting on jack nicholson's part so uh, once again 10 out of 10 11 out of 10 for what jack nicholson was doing and he had some great lines that have since become iconic like i'm not gonna kill you i'm just gonna bash your brains in and of course the famous here's johnny which at this point is probably a dated reference because that's how johnny carson was always introduced on the tonight show where ed mcmahon would go here's johnny at the be- you know at the beginning of every show and i think that was popular at the time so that's kind of why he said it oh i didn't know that right i and kind of i was I just going to say of, quickly his character uh, in the book was named john too although i think that line was not in the book but what were you going to say squishy I kind of wish that it wasn't such a big pop culture thing because it would have been terrifying and I'm sure at the time it was, but because you see it so often, it loses every ounce of its value. So, you know, just talking about that for briefly, just basically because of what you guys have said about your opinion of this film, do you think that it's because it was so 
um, it had such a profound effect on the general public when it first came out. And all these things became iconic lines and scenes, like the blood coming out of the elevator. Do you think it's almost been overhyped? So when you walked into the film, you expected far more than what you, or at least something completely different than what you got? Personally, absolutely. I was incredibly underwhelmed. I was underwhelmed not because of what I was expecting, but because everyone kept saying it was super scary, and I wasn't finding it scary. I found that a lot of the moments that were actually had excellent music behind them, nothing truly happened. There wasn't a threat to the family until the last third of the movie, when Jack Torrance really starts to lose his grip on everything and his personality changes. But once again, that's one out of the three characters. That's a whole third of the main cast be going to the dark side, you know? Right. So I wasn't I wasn't too enthralled with that. I didn't find a lot of the stuff that was scary, scary. The twins had, what, a culmination of maybe a minute and a half of screen time total. So that felt way underused. And the, the blood from the elevator was more symbolic than it was scary to me because it was clear that it was not a threat to anyone it was just a vision that danny was having that it would you would go back to and it didn't actually mean anything right it was like a sign or a portent that murder was coming or something awful was coming i suppose but i mean like that's all they really had were all these premonitions of red rum the um the blood from the elevator and then he danny does get a scene of the family being killed and that I thought was really, really cool because that fully the establishes... The original Grady's family. Yes. Yeah. Th that fully establishes, okay, this definitely happened. It's not some ghost story. And, you know, now Danny Shine is really starting to hit him in ways he wasn't ready for because he's only been seeing kind of relatively normal things. And now he's seeing, you know, crazy, horrifying things. But they never truly made a, a good connection between Room 237 and the murder because I caught at the beginning... After they were killed, he lined the, the Grady lined them up in his in the room, all you know, looking really nice or whatever they said he did in a certain room. And I was gonna say, oh, that's gonna be room two thirty seven, and they never really made that connection. Right, and that didn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. The whole room two thirty seven scene. There's a naked woman in the tub. She gets out. Jack hugs her, and then she's this rotting old naked lady. And what did that have to do with anything? Yeah, exactly. I felt like that was really... A lot of the things that they were trying to do in this movie were just creepy and out of place. And if you watch them on their own, say as their own short film, that would definitely be creepy because you would have no context as to what's going on. But we're going into this and seeing, okay, there's the shine. Now there's possibly ghosts and, you know, definitely an air of murder in the hotel. Okay, cool. Uh, yep, okay, Jack's losing his, his mind a little bit, all right? And um, now there's a, a woman in a, in a tub who's now messing with Jack, too, even though he's supposed to be the perpetrator. Right. I don't know. And Halloran mentions it, too, though. He does sort of say that, you know, like you said, The Shining was just basically their telepathy, and that's it. But Halloran did say, well, sometimes even buildings can kind of have The Shine, and it will keep uh, recording of, or a reflection of bad things that may have happened in the past or of things that happen if some may be bad and some may be good. This is true. They did establish that. But what bad thing happened with the woman, you know, like, like right. him getting flashes of the family? Yeah, I get that because that's the big tragedy that we're all focused on. But I don't know. I felt I like thought it, was... it was the wife because they never showed the wife. But they never showed. Grady's wife? Yeah. Oh, that could be. I suppose, but. But even then, they never really made that connection. And I was, you know, and it would have been one thing to kind of force the audience to guess. Sure. But that would require a few more hints to really kind of seal the deal for somebody who would want to theorize about the movie. Right. And they didn't do that enough. in My, opinion. my understanding is that the book may established early on that the place was haunted and people knew it was widely known that the place was haunted. And in the movie... When you start to see ghosts or what you think are ghosts, you wonder, are they in Jack's mind? And it really isn't until the end when the shit hits the fan and Wendy is running and she stops and looks and there's a room full of skeletons f and filled with cobwebs and the ghosts start to reveal themselves to her as well. And, then, and even then, it's still ambiguous. Well, exactly. See, to me, that felt out of place because Wendy hadn't seen anything. For all we know, they all they were 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 Danny tapping into the sixth sense with his shine 
and then Jack having hallucinations. They didn't fully establish that there was any one ghost because he didn't meet the Grady that we were introduced to by proxy at the beginning of the film. He met he met the same guy who had the same idea of kill my family, it'll be great. That was right. really it. You know, it, it didn't feel like they were establishing, okay, these are ghosts. They were establishing, okay, something weird is going on. It's all in Jack's head. Danny's getting a few flashes of things that did happen, and it's scaring him. And then Wendy's just kind of caught in the middle there. And then at the end, all of a sudden, Jack starts going on a murderous rampage, and now Wendy's seeing something, too, that we hadn't seen before either. Right. I, I don't even know what Wendy was looking at, but there was some dude in a mask and a body fur suit that... We oh yeah we didn't that see that weird. at all i was like that was just lame to me i feel like these are just a couple of just so many open-ended things like the blood that animal mask like the woman all of these things are just unanswered questions that are just thrown in and it almost feels like they were gonna answer it and then they just forgot or just ran out of time or yeah, it, it makes just me, felt so empty. It makes me wonder if there's extra footage lying somewhere in a cup, you know. Or like the writer room. was like, oh, this is going to be great, going to be great. Gets to the climax. Cool. Now we're going to slowly answer all the questions and dies. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I really wasn't wasn't feeling like they were telling a fully cohesive story other than family moves into a hotel that closes in the winter. Man goes on killing spree. Family manages to actually survive. Film at 11. <laughs> literally it felt like you could have done this in 20 minutes and it makes you wonder events. too because grady's the ghost of grady or whatever he was says to jack at one point you know you're the care caretaker you always were and then jack ends up in the picture from 1921 at the end and it makes you that even makes it even more ambiguous you're wondering well, what the heck was that all about was he a ghost all along or yeah i i felt like they were just trying to make it weird and creepy and make it super abstract which didn't help the film right i don't think that i don't think that added to the uniqueness of it i think that just really devalued any kind of cohesive narrative they were trying to tell i also feel like i like i hope that they answer some of these questions in doctor sleep but i also feel like you can't expect that because the time difference like when the first movie came out to when doctor sleep came out like last year i feel like you can't expect it so i feel like this is definitely one of the situations and scenarios where it would be a better idea to read the book fully right either before or after so that you have a better understanding because i can imagine that the book explains so much more right right all right one last thing i just wanted to touch upon was that the music i thought was very good intense and um, it, it really built to a crescendo. And one thing I noticed this go around, and I've seen this movie a handful of times, but I had never noticed it before. When Jack does the turn and starts to go after the family, the music, instead of just being background, all of a sudden it almost sounds like something out of the omen with chanting and these chanting voices, almost almost supernatural or demonic Um in the soundtrack as it's building and, it's, and the music was getting louder. And I never noticed that before. And I thought that was an interesting turn. I mean, what did you guys think of, of the music in the film? It almost felt excessive. Like I definitely noticed that it came to the forefront, which isn't something you really see in the movie. Like it felt like they had just accidentally knocked one of the knobs over that pulled it to the front <laughs> <laughs> and that it like it was supposed to be in the back. Like this movie just felt like a hot mess. It felt like parts of it definitely felt like a college like a freshman filmmaker was trying his best but just ended up with a really good cast. Ouch. <laughs> but not a full script. And this is nothing I think against we're going to get some hate King. mail in this one. <laughs> I have nothing against Stephen King. And I know that Stephen King doesn't even care for this movie. No, he had problems with Kubrick's vision. I liked the music, but I felt like it was used poorly. I felt like it was well made, well made tracks and really, really scary. And when Jack was going nutso, yeah, it was done well. It was super cool, super creepy. And when Danny was having his little visions, super cool, super creepy. But there were some moments where Danny's on his little tricycle roaming down the hallways, and the music's kicking up and kicking up, and I'm like, oh. 
okay, all right, what's going to happen? And then nothing happens. I'm right. Like, well, well, what was the point of that? I'm like, it's not even like it's not even creepy. You know, it doesn't even feel like he's being stalked by anything. It just feels like they're trying to make us uncomfortable, and I'm just more frustrated that they didn't actually do anything with right. the music. Hmm. So that was my complaint: was that I felt like there were so many moments that were supposed to be moments that were going to instill some real fear in us, real concern for the family, and really, really confused as to what's going on when it just turned out to be the music kicking up, and that's really the scariest part of the entire moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wonder if the intent was just to to fake you out, make you think, rather than do a jump scare, which they didn't really do a whole heck of a lot back then, you know, to fake you out and think something was going to happen, and then... I suppose, but the problem is, if you do that enough times and nothing happens, I'm not sitting there expecting something to happen. Boy, you cry wolf, yeah. Yeah, so I, was, I don't know. I didn't, they didn't have any crazy jump scares, which I actually applaud for the movie, personally. I feel like that's a very good stylistic choice because it's not a crazy, it's not a plot necessarily heavy movie, which works, but then when you have moments like that where something could happen and, you know, and then there's... And then they did this thing with the camera where they would zoom in really fast on things. Like, um, oh, I, I, the, when the cook gets killed they, like, and they see his body, that zooms in. It zoomed in on Danny's face a couple of times. I wasn't a personal fan of that, but I also felt like it was just kind of like, it was more to shock the audience. Like, oh my God, look at this. Right. When there weren't any characters or the characters weren't reacting enough for the audience to go with. Right. I don't know. I feel like there was just a, there was just so many good ideas that weren't done well. I thought the coolest scene was in at the end when Danny is running through the snow and Jack's following his footprints in the maze in the hedge maze. Which, by the way, there was no hedge maze in the novel. They were animal shapes that moved closer and closer to the building. But anyways, he's following the footsteps and Danny smartly decides to step backwards into the existing footprints and then dive off to the side. So when Jack gets to the end all of a sudden the footprints just stop and he, at that point he's so out of it he he can't figure out what to do and danny manages to escape i loved that i thought that danny was the best character i was like that, that's definitely the part where you're going to be rooting the hardest for danny because of you realize that he's way more like smarter and in tune then he kind of gives off. Because right. He just sort of gives off this vibe of like, he's just a quiet kid with a little bit of trauma, but he's actually really smart and really knows his way around. Manages and, to outwit Jack. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I agree. And when they have moments like that where Jack is hunting the family and, you know, they're actually doing things. I feel like all those moments were actually pretty scary because you're sitting there like like Jack's got the axe and hunting after Danny and you can only imagine how cold it is out there in, right. the, in the snow. I'm like, okay, cool. This is pretty pretty intense. I'm like, I don't want to. I'm worried Danny's going to run into a dead end. Right. Jack's going to get him. Exactly. So I'm like, okay, cool. Those moments worked so well. It's when the music kicked up. That's when you actually had somewhat of a credible threat. When the supernatural stuff came into play, I was very underwhelmed. Right. That's okay. my, my final take on the movie. Okay, so that's your final thought. Squishy, what are your, what's your final thought on the movie? I was pleased with the ending and some of the acting, but that's it. <laughs> I, like, I understand that it's a cult favorite and that like people that saw it when it came out like think it's this great big thing. I think there are definitely movies that have done better. I think if they remade it, like now... Which, well, they did. They did a TV... Uh, uh, miniseries. Yeah, I can imagine that, like, it being redone. I think, th I wish that they had gone more of the route of following Stephen King because it felt like it was inspired by the book, not based off of it. Right, you get two people, one with a vision, and then one with a different kind of vision, and then he takes that vision, the original vision, and changes it. It doesn't necessarily work all the time. So would you guys recommend this to people your age or younger? Not necessarily it depends on what you're looking for in my opinion if you want scary this is not the film in my opinion if you want interesting creepy and abstract this is definitely a good movie and if, if you, you want to be like in on like if you 
we want to go through all like the classic movies and watch it, then this is definitely going to be on the list of a classic. I uh, yeah, I could call this movie a classic because of the uh, profound effect it had at the time it came out. Right. Because this is also riding hot off the heels of the Halloween movies. Right. At least the first one, and that was a big, big thing of like, wow, this changed horror entirely. It gave, it pretty much gave birth to the slasher genre. I'm sure there were films like it beforehand, but. It really inspired right. a lot That's of That's a them. topic for another day, but yeah. But <laughs> this is this is that era, and so when you make a movie like this, and it's just super abstract, there's a lot of unanswered questions, a lot more confusion, and a lot more weirdness going on, and a lot less concrete, it, do, it works when you go into it thinking about that. When you're expecting that, it's very, very well done. When you go into it expecting to be scared and, you know, all this crazy crazy stuff all these good ideas that were super super fleshed out i don't think you're gonna find that in this movie right and i'm just gonna say you know like i said at the beginning when i saw this when i was 10 it scared the crap out of me and um i, I actually over the years when i would think about watching it i would think oh geez this is kind of too long and i don't know if i want to sit through it and i have caught it a few times in the past couple of years and i think i've enjoyed it more in my adult life than i did as a kid but i can see you guys' take on it as well so it's up to you the audience to decide what you think about the shining just maybe you want to check it out and then uh, give it your own opinion after that thank you for joining us uh squishy and spency here on uh, then is now podcast and we will talk again soon thank you for having us thank you Well, we hope you enjoyed this special edition episode of Then Is Now called 13 Days of Hallotober. If you want to chime in on today's show, please send us an email at thenisnow42 at gmail.com. And you can also check out our website, havenpodcasts.com. And we have another show called The East Meets the West, where we discuss spaghetti westerns and shaw brothers movies so we hope you check that show out as well as always please leave us a review on itunes so that more people can find us and spread the word about then is now join us again next episode
scream the whole time. All right, we're recording now. Are you going to do an intro? Or? Uh, yeah, uh, just give me a second. Okay, take your time. <laughs> That's okay. All right, stop yeah. talking. Okay, um... <laughs> Thank you.